This is NAB Show Live. Welcome back to NAB Show Live. I'm your host for this hour, Brian Seth Hurst, and I have something very special planned for this hour. Uh, just a brief thing. We're coming to you live from the Central Hall Grand Lobby at NAB Show 2019. There's a lot going on today, a lot of construction on the floor. We're waiting for everything to have the grand opening tomorrow, and we're going to cover it from sunup to sundown with a great staff of anchors and people in the field, so be sure to tune in all week. My special guests today are from AR Wall, and I just want to say I was invited to your launch party. I don't know how, but I was invited to your launch party. And I showed up and I went, <laughs> I was completely blown away. And even I noticed you talking to our director, Steve, today, and he said, this is revolutionary. This is going to change everything. So we're here today to discuss how you are going to change everything. <laughs> Not too high an expectation. <laughs> and um, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to introduce you down the line so we know we have and then tell us a little bit about what you do at the company but I'm going to let you speak to what the company is first so Renee Amador yes you are the CEO, CEO and of president AR wall and president of AR wall that's right tell us about the company and tell us about your colleagues yeah, um, so uh, AR Wall is an augmented reality technology company. Uh, we just opened our first permanent location in Burbank, California, so in LA. Uh, so we're an LA local company. Uh, we started off in January 2017. Uh, so we're a little over two years old at the moment. And uh, right next to me, I have Jocelyn Sue, our chief product officer, uh, Eric Navaretti, our chief marketing officer and uh, Will Hellwarth, our Chief Interactive Officer. Uh, we are all co-founders uh, of the company. Uh, yeah, and we're the ones making it happen. That's why we're here. <laughs> Out of 100 people, how many people say, let's go to the server? I'm sorry, it feels like family. <laughs> it just does. <laughs> so explain first for those in our audience who do not know what augmented reality is, what it actually is because there are so many definitions and it's a buzzword right now sure and you guys are actually bringing substance behind the buzzword so what is augmented reality yeah absolutely so um the most the, i think the easiest way to explain it is it's a way to uh add computer generated either audio or visual often it's visual um overlaid onto the real world so when most of what people are talking about is stuff like pokemon go when you're uh, throwing the ball to try and catch the Pokemon. That type of thing is augmented reality. That's where people are most familiar with, so on mobile. Um, and then the next thing that's coming out, of course, is augmented reality headsets, uh, which is like HoloLens and Magic Leap. And really, uh, it's gaming, it's, uh, it's enterprise, and it's everything in between. And, and one way to think about it is all that information that's kind of stuck in the computer, all this awesome data, like about what the world is and what so the all meaning. All Google's data. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so all the data that's like available in the world in the internet can actually be associated with the spaces that that data is relevant. So you might come into this convention and learn about the history of the building or learn about who's here or what's happening right now. Uh, that's kind of the power of augmented reality. But that's a little bit different uh, than our focus at AR World. What we're, we're specifically doing is creating something new, which is called we're calling large-scale augmented reality. For filmmakers, this is going to be most relevant uh, with our invention ARFX, augmented reality FX, which is a new way of doing uh, composites with CG environments re that requires no green screen and no post-visual effects. So I'm going to go to you, Jocelyn, because you're the chief product officer, yes? Yes. So when it comes time to talk to the studios, because they're going to be your client, right, for this technology, mm -hmm. when it comes, comes time to talk to the studios, what is your, because you're, would you say you're disrupting the filmmaking industry with this, that this is a disruption that actually preempts a lot of other things that they've been used to doing? And how do you tell that story? You can, as chief marketing officer, you, you Eric, as well, can answer that. So Yeah, um, so I don't know if we're disrupting. I feel like what we're really doing is bringing uh, collaboration back on set. Because, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays, when you're talking about visual effects, people are... You know, there's a saying that, that people have, which is fix it in post, right? You shoot it on a green screen, and then everyone on set is like, well, I don't know what's going to be on that green wall, but I guess someone's going to fix that later. And so some, some artists later on in the process, you know, not even related to being on set, has to then 
fix the green screen shot and make it actually look like a real visual effect. Not to shot. mention the actors that are just exactly. So not, everyone's just kind of guessing. A, we're going to have a demo of this in a bit so that you yeah. can actually see how it works. But the uh, the idea. So when you demo, so you're in Burbank, so you're obviously mm -hmm. close to the studios. Yep. Very yeah. close from either side, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you how do you sell this? How do you is the demo enough, or you say? Here are your costs when you're doing green screen technology, and here's all your fixes in post. Here's how we're going to save you time. Here's how we're going to save you efficiency. And here's how we're going to collaborate with you to customize the product. How do you go about that? So um, the biggest sell that, uh, that we do is we showed the demo, and it's going to be quite interesting to see it in person because you know just watching a video doesn't quite give you the same effect. But what, what we do is we show the filmmakers, like, look, you can bring collaboration back on set. How, like it was really meant to be, right? Like our, the original filmmakers, it was all about this collaboration on set. Everyone had their specialty, and they could bring it together and create like the final shots together. And that's what we're re really promising filmmakers again. Instead of having a visual effects artist at the end of the, the, the timeline in post-production, we invite them on set so that they can adjust the background and make changes for the direction. And, and when you're done on set, you're basically walking away with your final shot. There's no um, post effects uh, involved. So let's talk about set design for a moment. So now you're going to work with art directors, right? Mm -hmm. You're going yeah. to, you, you come in at the beginning of the collaboration, correct? Yes. So when the art director comes in and the scenic designers come in and they, they do their design, you're going to, is there a special set of tools? or is it computer-assisted drafting that they've been used to doing anyway? How do you work with them to design the set? So essentially, let me just, because we, and maybe the videos will explain uh, more closely, but what we're actually talking about is I'm, uh, as the actor, I'm actually seeing the set that I'm in and I actually get to move within that set even though it's virtual. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's actually better than virtual, right? Because I can get in it. Yeah, yeah. You can you can start to have um, experiences where the line between the physical and the virtual is starting to blur, uh, and that's one of the reasons for that is because there's actual physical photons coming out of the screen, hitting the sets, hitting the actors, and uh, creating that that beautiful composite with light. Um, and and yeah. there's it, it can't be three D and stereoscopic as well, right? A absolutely. Um, so. Everything, everything that you can essentially do with filmmaking is possible with our technology. We're not really putting uh, that many new constraints on the process. Uh, on the contrary, we're taking off a lot of constraints, especially uh, in comparison to green screen. That's, that's really Those right. sets still need to be built, or the green screen, I'm trying to understand as someone who's never <laughs> experienced this Eric, before. Eric can't help. Sure. Eric's usually yeah. the one working with people. Yeah. So uh, one of the ways to imagine this is that it's an extension of the physical set that, that you're building. One of the reasons why we bring up uh, collaborativeness is that uh, instead of different departments being siloed off and maybe their input, their voice not being um, as important until you get further into the post-production uh, uh, stage of production, what we're saying is we get everyone to sit down together, we agree on the look feel of the, the set that you're building, the space that you're building, and we construct the physical set in front of the LED wall, um, and then we create the virtual set extension that perfectly matches it one-to-one -one and have that displayed behind where your performers okay. are. So here's, here's say, <laughs> okay. Say we are, we are standing in Times Square. Sure. And we're going to, it's New Year's Eve in Times Square, but we're not really in Times Square. Mm -hmm. We are all at this desk. You are going to, instead of a green screen, we are actually going to have that projection be an extension right, right here. So we're actually going to look like we are really standing in Times Square, and it's seamless. So you're starting to see what is so exciting about this. One of the things that we tell um, productions is that in five years, we'd love to be uh, the, the largest uh, supplier of sets and locations for film and television. And you can think about it in this way. Um, traditionally what people would do is they'd go out to, uh, to a rental company and you're, you're shooting a scene in a penthouse, right? And you'd get a, 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 a giant translight that you put behind your set that shows maybe an urban skyline 
or you know, a specific uh, iconic building from New York or whatever it is that you want in the background, right? And they physically have that printout sitting in a back room, right? That they pull out of storage and then they, they bring it out to your set and they light it and you're there. Or maybe they have painted flats, you know, uh, uh, standard set pieces that I need a doctor's office, I need a jail room, I need a whatever, right? Somebody physically pulls that out of storage, sets it up on your stage, and then you dress it accordingly for your production. What we're saying is we can go out to Times Square, we could send a team and uh, acquire that location digitally, and we could do it at dawn, dusk, uh, evening, uh, and, and be able to give you the ability to shoot your scene, your, your climactic moment where you know, your actors meet in the middle of Times Square, and you don't have to get the permits to shut that location down. You don't need to move your entire uh, set and crew uh, over there. Uh, you can shoot it from the convenience of a soundstage running one of our technologies, and it'll look just like they're standing there in that physical space. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of increased frame rate, which we just discussed, mm -hmm. and increased resolution. So when you have trans lights and you have painted flats, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work as resolution increases and frame rates increase, right? Exactly. So this is the answer to higher resolution, higher definition. Absolutely. So that, so you're actually, so, one, you're solving location problems. Mm -hmm. You're solving, and in location problems is permitting, is weather. Yes. <laughs> is all of the things, like right, right now we're on our way to Philadelphia after this, mm -hmm. and I'm just praying it doesn't rain. That's, that's my <laughs> okay. big prayers, it doesn't rain. Mm -hmm. Because it will just completely screw everything up. And so, I would, I, I'm trying to figure out how to do this as a producer now. I say to you, look, I'm going to be shooting this scene in Times Square. Mm -hmm. It takes place 5 o'clock in the afternoon in, in August. So it's late summer light. You'll be able to make those adjustments, right? You'll, so you can still do some post adjustments on what you're shooting, right? You can change lighting and color? Yes, we could still do that. Okay. So now I'm saying to you, this is going to be 8 o'clock summer evening. Times Square, I'm right in front of the New York Times building, and there is a, I'm actually having a riot happen in Times Square. I'm the reporter that's reporting on that riot, and all these people are coming towards me, and I need all of that. So I'm going to composite in the riots, I'm going to do that in VFX, I can do that, right? Uh, but every, the whole environment that it's happening in, now I'm telling you exactly what I need. Who designs that? They design this and talk to you? The, the art directors talk to you and then say, this is what we need, and we really want to be able to see these things pop? Sure, so, um, I mean, regarding the specific things that you want to show up into a shot, for instance, you have a big unruly mob. It could be zombies, it could be robots, it could just be people, uh, whatever, whatever your production is, right? What we explicitly want to uh, have people understand is that we're a technology company. We're, we're not necessarily interested in being a visual effects shop. So what we would do is we would speak to your production, speak to your visual effects uh, studio that you've already hired, and let them know these are how your assets should be delivered to us so that they run on our platform. Um, odds are they're already building it that way anyways. They just don't package that final thing uh, for you. So we would work in concert with so them. you're actually just like slipping right into the workflow. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So no, there's no change in workflow. There's, there's one change, which is the assets, instead of having it done at in post, we have to, you know, it really makes more sense for it to be ready in pre-production. So we're just moving that one part into the pre-production phase so that when you're on set, then everyone on set can actually see the background and the backdrop in AR wall. And, and we can also still make changes on set, depending if you, you found something new that you wanted to add in. So you may or may not want to answer this question. Okay. I just like a layman answering questions. Have you done an analysis on cost savings in terms of how efficient, both cost and time, compared to the production pipeline as it is now, the workflow as it is now? Yeah, um, so, so we've already done a few productions, uh, and in the cost analysis that we've done, we're looking at a 40% reduction in cost for those effect shots. So basically that means if, you know, if you're making one of these gigantic blockbuster films, you're probably spending 50% just on visual effects. Um, what we're saying is those visual effect shots that are associated with green screen, uh, it's, it's reasonable for us to talk about reducing that by 40%. So 
uh, th we're realistically talking about tens of millions of dollars for one of these larger productions. So you can imagine that's why uh, we're currently in, in, in discussions with every major studio in Hollywood. I would guess, and not only that, it's like it's probably conflict of interest while I'm on the show to ask you how do I invest, but we'll talk about that afterwards. Uh, where did this come from? Yeah. Where, where did you all come from? What's your, what are your backgrounds? Um, so all of us here are actually creators. Um, we, uh, uh, myself, Jocelyn, and Eric, uh, we ran a commercial production company, an ad agency, for eight years uh, prior to this. Uh, uh, Will Hellwarth, he's an award-winning game developer uh, in augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, so you can see we're an eclectic bunch here. Uh, we, uh, I myself, I'm a commercial director. Uh, Jocelyn is a developer and a commercial producer. Eric's a marketer and a producer. Um, we come from all sorts of uh, different worlds here and different uh, disciplines. And, and the way that we essentially came up with this is looking at, um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like the best things happen out of a fit of frustration. In those moments, I, I myself, uh, uh, I have quite a bit of background in visual effects, uh, compositing and that type of stuff. Um, I worked in, uh, in visual effects for trailers for quite a long time. You see uh, kind of how the sausage is made in those circumstances. And uh, it's really in those moments where you're painting out hair uh, on the green screen frame by frame. You, you go, gosh, uh, I cannot be 65 years old, about to retire, still painting out uh, green, green screen shots. So what, what would be the next stage? What would be the technology that I'm waiting for that is going to get me out of this dark uh, you know, room uh, and back on set, back doing interesting stuff that I'm interested in doing? Um, and it wasn't until we, uh, we saw augmented reality uh, and virtual reality and what these technologies were doing with real-time graphics. And I think that's really where the light bulb went off when we realized, okay, rear projection, you know, what you would, what you would imagine, you know, Hitchcock using uh, behind his actors in a car scene, right, that type of thing. Well, the reason that that stopped being used, um, even though it's, a, it's an excellent technology, is because you can't move the camera, right? As soon as you um, track back and forth, the parallax breaks. It was breaks. also painfully obvious. It was painfully <laughs> obvious. But for example, like, um, if, you go back, if you go back and you look at uh, Wizard of Oz and look at those tornado scenes, some of those composites that they were able to achieve with rear projection are just absolutely stunning. Um, and that's because it's real physical photons spilling onto that scene. So our, our thought was, well, we can, we have reached the point in technology where you can track the camera in real time. In the time that the shutter opens and closes, uh, you know, 1 24th of a second, you can update uh, one of these uh, displays to actually um, uh, uh, match the, frame the, the frame rate of the, of the camera. And once we reach that level, this type of technology becomes possible. Um, so that's really that's really what we did. So even in, if you're so obviously you you could use this in virtual reality in 360 as well. Uh, conceivably, yeah, you could. And you could well, obviously you'd be working at 60 frames per second. You could still respond to 60 frames per second or higher. Yes. Um, right. That's something that we're working on right now. We have uh, 24 frames per second uh, now. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> A little bit above that, but so, so, I think we're still I mean, working. Running what, yeah. Huh? I think we run 60. These yeah, days, we yeah. can run. We can run 60. Um, for us, it's we all have about to, or Will would have to quit. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, if for us, it's all about speed and accuracy. That's what we. That's what we mean when we say that we're a technology company. We, you know, creating beautiful images is is awesome, and there's lots of people that can do that in the world that are way better than us. What we're specifically doing is attacking that speed and accuracy problem, and that's what differentiates us from other visual, uh, other effects companies, and also like previous companies and companies that are all working in real time, but their speed and accuracy doesn't have the same threshold that that we have and that we need. Yeah, and I actually remember when I'm old enough to remember when previous started and how. <laughs> That was cost savings. And now when you look and you say, okay, there are so many assets that it's just, this is just like a, there was a problem waiting, obviously, for a solution instead of the other way around. Mm -hmm. Was it a, a moment of inspiration where like you were all sitting down and saying, what if? Um, I think the moment of inspiration was in realizing that something that could be a cool trick for a couple shots actually had um, legs, le legs. Yeah. That this, that there was actually a need for something like this, and and the only reason that we saw this need um, is because we have been working with green screen for quite a while. Uh, I myself, as a commercial director, I've been in I've been in situations where 
you know, I'm there on set with a major client of a major brand. Uh, we're on shooting a green screen shoot. And, you know, I'm like, hey, how does it look? And they go, great, you know, it looks awesome. And then we get into post-production and we start to do the composite and they go, wow. Wow. <laughs> Somebody's breaking glass over there. Um, uh, we get, special effect. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we get into post-production and we're doing the composite and they go, what the heck is this? What, what am I even looking at? And I go, gosh, I thought they, we got the sign off for this shot. And they go, well, I didn't know what I was looking at. I was looking at a gigantic green wall. I, didn't, I don't know what was going on. So I think in those instances, you have clients, you have cast, you have crew um, that, that need something like this uh, like constantly. Uh, it's you know if and you think you can't go over budget, <laughs> so when you go back into post, you're like, oh my god, there's a fix. Yeah, that's going to take this amount of time and this amount of money. So. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, it's I think it's um, it's thinking about what other filmmakers are facing. We had we kind of had this technology as something spinning in the back of our minds for one specific project. As you can imagine, it was a high end science fiction project, uh, that type of thing, um, and and just realizing, gosh. People are really interested in this. When we first started talking about it uh, with people seriously, in a, you know, in a serious way, started talking to filmmakers and stuff, um, they were telling us stuff that I think that we had felt but never actually heard out loud. Stuff like, you know what? I hate green screen. People were telling us, I hate green screen. It's the bane of my existence. I dread shooting and then waiting a year and then going back into the room with the visual effects artist, trying to remember what was I, what was thinking. I thinking, what was I trying yeah. to yeah. accomplish uh, a year ago, sometimes two years. And there's even um, filmmakers that we've spoken with that they shoot on green screen, they go and do another project, and then they're coming back year, two years later, completing those visual effects shots. It's like they're not even the same human being in the beginning and the yeah. end of that process. So, so yeah. I wanna I wanna get to the videos because we want to make sure we have enough time for Absolutely. Demo, Let's so. show the tech explainer. Well, Number where are you, Steve? Number one. <laughs> that's a, that's amazing, and that's so well explained in such a short space of time. Thank you, thank you. Is there I, anything you'd like to add to that? I think I there's a couple a couple <laughs> things that we should point out in that big science fiction set that you saw uh, uh, through the bulk of that video. Um, one of the benefits to using our technology that maybe isn't just readily apparent is that when you do a green screen production, uh, you, you have like, for instance, your visual effects supervisor, if I were to hold this up in the middle of a scene, they'd slap it out of my hands because compositing through the, this refracting surface right here with the liquid inside of it, just burn another $10,000 to make that shot happen, right? There's materials that you're not typically allowed to build with, to, have your, to construct your set with. There's certain costuming choices, hair choices uh, that you're not allowed to put your actors in. There's even limitations on the sort of lighting that you need to have because you need to get that beautiful uh, uh, plate that you can then composite all around. All those are gone. And all of that's out the window. We're basically telling a filmmaker that you can make your production the way you, the way you head. originally dreamt it, the way your, your heart wants to do it, and not be limited it's by the me, restrictions. Because I have no hair choice. <laughs> it's also, uh, sorry, I just also wanted to mention, there's also the freedom of the cameraman to move anywhere on set, which is, you know, for some green screen shots, that can be very expensive to move the camera. Yeah, and that was the, that's the demo we're actually going to be doing, that's correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was the demo that I did at your offices. So, yeah. yeah. What are we looking at next? 
Okay, so um, we have actually done a project. We did a major um, deployment for NBC Universal. This was a project called Night Flyers. Uh, for those of you that know Night Flyers, you know it's the it's a George R R Martin uh, franchise. He wrote it in the '80s, and it was recently adapted by Sci Fi Channel. If you're international, you can uh, find it on Netflix. But here's uh, behind the scenes of Air Walt's involvement on set. Terrific. Number two. It's so So when we first turned on the R wall on set, it was an incredible reaction from the cast and crew, especially the camera guy who had never seen anything like it. When you look out at the AR wall, it looks like you're looking out into space or into your environment. It doesn't look like you're looking at a flat plane. It looks like you're looking into a different world. The really impressive thing for me was the way the light just lit up the entire set, lit up actors' faces, elements passing through or by the spaceship on the screen. You could see you know, the light change on set in this subtle, beautiful way. So the moment we arrived on set, the day of, we just turned it on and the scene was already good to go. We showed up on set, the LED screens were already set up. We were completely finished before they were even done blocking their actors. Anytime you move the camera around or need to change anything on set or move the perspective on set or just visualize it on set, it's already there and ready. Will, you spoke. <laughs> For the first time, yes. You speak. I'm glad we had some of me speaking. Is there anything you would like to add to that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, it, that was most of uh, my set experience, but uh, what was really fun for me and, and what I'm most excited about is, uh, of course, the interactive, the, the uh, live control uh, features that basically we're calling like giving the director a magic wand, essentially. So this is something that we're working on. I think we've got uh, like very uh, brief examples of it in the demo, possibly, but essentially, you know, uh, these guys are all totally head in the clouds about, oh, we can just push the image out and it's running real time and look, 60 frames a second and there we go, that's just like the VFX. And I'm thinking from a game background, like, no, it's interactive now. We can point at things and they'll change. We can have the director cue actions. We can track the actor's movement and have virtual backup dancers. Like, we can make the whole, you know, suite of tools, basically. Um, and so on set, the most exciting thing for me was, uh, you know, talking to the DP and making changes, just looking at the screen and going, oh, you know what, the, the spaceships should be a little bit this way. The arms are going a little bit too fast and just done. And, the, you know, the DP uh, who's, on any production, very meticulous, you know, is looking at everything, and then you come to a green screen, and he's basically just forced to go, oh yeah, well, whatever, you know, and it's, compared to the amount of attention that he paid to everything else, it's ridiculous, right? So I think that, that and specifically, uh, we, I got to uh, press the button and launch the spaceship into space, and that was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty fun. Um, in terms of um, having more creative control in the moment uh, for DPs, that must be like mana. Yeah, I mean, I mean because uh, their whole thing can get screwed up. I mean, oh yeah, and cinematographers. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's also just nice to have the options. If you're saying a late summer evening in New York, well, it's like maybe it's a little bit too orange or yellow or late or early, and it's done right there. And the light looks good, and you can just check it, and you can test a bunch of things that you didn't even know that you wanted, basically. What is the compute power you need for this? Uh, so we build our own machines, and they are equivalent to very, very high-end gaming machines, or past. Like super high-end gaming machines, or? We I would definitely yeah. say past. Past, yeah. <laughs> like some of the highest end rendering technology that is available <laughs> is in well, our machines. Nothing's being done in the cloud, though. It's all being done. Yeah, all of it's local here. And, and part of that is to preserve the speed and accuracy, as Renee is saying, the latency. Amazing. Yeah. One of the things um, I should know, also I want to give a shout out uh, to the folks at Night Flyers. Um, John Corser, the VP of production at uh, Universal Cable, he's been our champion uh, and was one of the first people to actually listen to us and, and what we've been up to. So John, you're awesome. Uh, and then of course Mike Cahill and Marcus Federer, the director and, and uh, DP on Night Flyers for the pilot. Uh, those guys are awesome. And they, they were really championing this more than anyone, uh, and you know that you've created something that is truly about storytelling when it's the creatives that are pushing it uh, down, you know, uh, pushing it through the process, making, you know, the production designer and, you know, the gaffer and all these people who have no idea what the heck is going on, no idea what you're doing there. Um, and then you step on set and they actually turn on the screen and see what's happening. And then they go, yeah. okay. Just like I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It uh, must yeah. be really gratifying to work with creators who like get it like that. 
Yeah. Like, um, there's not a lot of explanation. It's just like, okay, let's get to work. Yeah. I mean, it, one thing one thing that, that I think is startling to me is uh, as, I, as I'm getting older, I started doing this when I was 17 in high school, uh, making, making videos. Um, and really, for, for any filmmaker that's, that's about my age or younger, um, green screen has actually existed our entire lives. It, you know, it kind of, digital green screen was kind of invented like in the mid 80s, early 80s, somewhere around there. Um, so to us, it's actually a old, you know, it's grandpa technology. Um, and Thank we're, you. <laughs> and we're looking for, you know, what's, what's, what's next. So we're seeing a lot of filmmakers moving away from green screen in a variety of ways. And hopefully our offering um, here is something that isn't just a fit for like the, you know, the John Favros and the Russo brothers of the world that have, uh, you know, 100 million plus, but we're actually creating this technology so it can affect the entire industry. Will you have stock footage as well? Yeah. Yeah, stock footage. So that, that addresses exactly that, that lower, I don't want to say lower end, entry level yeah. of yeah. creator that's looking to be able to, to save time, cost, and, and really have a, a, a very realistic set. Exactly. And like, I, I'm, I, I, myself and Jocelyn, we very much come from the tradition of uh, guerrilla filmmaking. And um, to the end, we actually made a, made a clip which is very guerrilla feeling, almost feels um, uh, like a running gun uh, production, but was shot in our uh, production lab in Burbank. I think that's the that's next. That's what we're going to see yeah. next. Number three, Steve. It's nice to know that you haven't lost your gorilla roots. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that is because that will keep you innovating. Yeah. It yep. is that thirst to keep going and keep innovating. And I personally, as a producer, I am always looking how to make the technology serve the story. And I have noticed just in augmented and virtual reality and what's happened over the last year, we've seen a lot of death. Mm. We've seen <laughs> a lot of money that was spent in the beginning. And by the time cameras were released or technology was released, they had been leapfrogged by other technologies. So it's this constant, uh, very, very fast uh, innovation curve. And that's what, I don't know if you had the chance to hear Michael Manzuri before you, but we were talking about the, just the evolution of cameras and how fast they go. Mm -hmm. So when I was at your office, while I was waiting, because there was a line for the AR wall, <laughs> over here was what I can best describe as a lo location-based entertainment experience where, was it a dragon that I was mm. interacting with? Tell, yeah. tell us about, is that technology based on the same technology and it's just more interactive? Yeah, so I mean, another... And responsive. I, I, what was great about, uh, I mean, uh, the collaboration that we have, they're from a filmmaking background and I'm from a game development background, is I was kind of just able to see all these opportunities that, you know, what lit my fire about this is, oh, we're using real-time rendering. We can, you know, that's, what, that's my language. There's all kinds of things that you guys have never thought about that are great here. Um, and uh, uh, one of the big ones uh, is uh, instead of using a camera, as our normal system is filmmaking, so we're tracking the camera, and it, it's to match the camera's perspective, we're matching a user's perspective by tracking their head and basically having the camera focal point between the eyes instead of on an actual camera. So in this situation, uh, it's basically the user walks up to the screen uh, and sensors pick them up. They don't have to touch anything. They don't have to hold anything. They don't have to put anything on, basically. Sensors pick them up and perform the exact sort of uh, mirror uh, uh, window illusion, basically, um, to, their, to their head. So you walk up to a screen and it looks like 
basically, you know, my target is, is any giant LED screen at a convention or a mall that's just playing video or playing something to get you to pay attention and, you know, take a selfie or whatever. Uh, and, and my kind of pitch on that is what if, you know, you walk past something and the character looks at you, waves at you, and you now see this whole world and portal behind them that you, when you walk around, changes and you can see different things about it and they, like, you know, they, they interact with you and you can say hi and you can, you know, push them away or something. And, all these kinds of things uh, uh, is what we're working on right now. Is, is it's great, great for brands. You know, I, I remember um, being in South by Southwest and there was this city block that was just lights. Then, and you would jump and you would move and you, the lights would light up to imitate your movement. And people couldn't stop doing it. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's like public art installation that's public art interactive installation. But I can see where brands yeah. would figure out ways for people to have a deeper relationship with their brand through this kind of technology. These experiences actually are come from my personal experiments with uh, using this technology for art installations and for interactive art. And, and, and you know, it's, I never thought, I, these are these little prototypes I made in you know, school and I never thought you know, would be doing anything or I'd be coming back to them and now it's like airports and yeah, malls. Pioneers never yeah. know yeah. that they're pioneers. <laughs> Innovators never, they, you ask them and they go, no, I was just doing something I thought of, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think one of the key things that I'd like to point out about uh, AR3D, our interactive uh, uh, platform, is that it's the interactivity that a user would expect from a virtual reality experience, but there's no headset, there's no wearables, there's no trackers. It's as simple as somebody walking up to a TV monitor, an LED wall, could even be projection based, but walking up to it and having a seamless experience that's absolutely frictionless. Um, that's, I, I, I think, the future that people are are probably most interested in, not so much getting uh, suited up all the time for uh, a simple it's experience. Really, I mean, we could talk an hour about that, right. mm -hmm. about the continuum of immersion, mm -hmm. which actually is not a bad term, <laughs> um, but that whole idea of suspending reality by being fully immersed, by being in a headset, versus interacting in the real world through augmented reality or through interactivity. One interesting thing as well, I mean, if our screens for, for a lot easier basically have a much higher F of, uh, field of view than, than the current augmented reality headsets, just by walking up to one of them. I mean, uh, it, it seems like a counterintuitive way to fill your vision with you know, the, the screen or with the digital content, but uh, it's actually very convenient. See, I, we could we'd have this great debate. I think every technology has its its application and its place. But I, as a storyteller and as a writer, when I want you to suspend all of this to be in the world that I've created, that's where virtual reality became was a, like a dream come true. Hmm. And that one of the reasons I asked you about the technology in 360, and you have all these triple A virtual reality games starting to come on, like mm. Contagion and, and all of these things that we're getting there, it seems to me you could up that game, so to speak, with your technology in not just, uh, not just games, but also in augmenting live action 360. Because Absolutely. you know when we have to go out, the, the, one of the pieces we shot was on location in Virginia, in the mud at 5.30 in the morning, and you know, the audience didn't get to see the mud. <laughs> you know, it wasn't about the mud, it was about us getting through the mud to the location. So the idea of being able to do this, and it's, it's a combination of 360 and 180. So that collaboration that you've already established with storytellers, carrying that into virtual reality and, and full immersion, I, I look forward to that as well. I would like to have, the 40% cost <laughs> savings there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go to the demo. Yes. We have Patrick and Isaac. Where All are right. you guys? There they are. They're coming on stage. And we have our, our great cameraman on the TVU, Brian, who's actually going to explain how to do this. And these guys won't be able to talk because they don't have mics, so you're going to need to talk. All right, so I'm going to explain what you're seeing here. Um, so this was actually one of the first scenes that we created. Uh, this is a science fiction, uh, like cy cyberpunk city uh, that you're looking at here. And specifically, um, what you're seeing is uh, from the camera's perspective. So, Brian is the cameraman. Um, so, this is, is a little bit cameraman. confusing because we have two I'm cameras. Sorry. I'm sorry, two, not Brian. Two camera setups here. Isaac is the cameraman. Yes. Yeah, look, looks like we have a calibration issue. Let's fix that. Just a second. This is something that we didn't find out until we got on set with uh, night flyers, but uh, uh, one, of, one of the issues that we've had is a high Wi-Fi traffic areas. Uh, and so all the setup tests were fine and the actors show up on set and it's okay. like, <laughs> airplane noise, okay, there so we it's go. Working, it's working well now. So, um, so okay, so from the, from the naked eye, 
This looks a little weird. It looks a little distorted. He's moving around. What's going on? Um, it doesn't look like anything quite much. From the perspective of the camera, which is the, which is the smartphone that he's holding in his hand, what he's experiencing is a window into the virtual environment. Uh, so as he moves around, he experiences parallax and depth, and uh, it's real photons coming out of the screen and hitting his lens. And this is really what we're talking about. It's a window into the virtual environment. So you can imagine sets, actors, everything in front of this uh, screen. You know, blow up this screen by 10 times, uh, and, you, and you'll understand what we're talking about. Uh, the largest screen that, uh, deployment that we've done is 45 feet by 15 feet. What is the one that's in your office, just for my own curiosity? So the one that's in our lab in Burbank, uh, and this is actually rentable, a rentable space and a rentable screen, it's 18 feet by 9 feet, and that's just massive. That's about a 4K screen. And, um, and the largest one that we've done is about 6.5K. So just, just unbelievable amounts of resolution that we're pumping out here. So as Isaac has the camera, where is the actor in front of him? Yeah. 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 So everything is happening uh, between so the camera and the screen. So if I stood between him and there screen. in a larger screen, not this exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But in a larger screen, if I stood between him and this large screen, I'm on the set. I'm there. It does appear as if you're in the same space as the set. So it compensates for perspective. Yes. Mm -hmm. Size, parallax, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. How, it, and you can is switch it doing out that on the fly. It's doing yes. it all on the fly. And How? Oh, <laughs> well, wait, is that the secret sauce? Yes, I can't tell you that. <laughs> Look, that's the stuff, that's, the stuff that's, the, that's amazing about VR and AR, and, and, and to some extent also Bitcoin. Um, the, all these three technologies use the same uh, type of processors to complete these. Um, so we're talking about a lot of processing power. A lot of processing power. I mean, I don't know what the actual numbers are. About an over the data center. Over right? the last two years alone, I mean, it's, it's, it's been unbelievable. And, and we're, we're in situations where stuff that we didn't even think was possible when we founded the company is now like a commonplace thing to be seeing. Um, so that just gives you an idea of how fast this is moving. So for us, we're almost rising on the crest of this wave of, the, of processor power and graphics power and spatial technology as a whole. So this is basically what it looks like. Um, and instead of that smartphone, you can swap out any camera, literally any camera. We've used Reds and Blackmagic and you know uh, everything down to DSLRs and everything like that. So yeah, and in terms this is it. Of, and, and so you're actually, uh, what is, that's so many questions. <laughs> What is tracking my movements in front of the camera that is making the adjustment while I'm moving? Yeah, so <laughs> it, it gets a little very technical, but the easy way to say it is it's like, um, it's like lasers that are tracking in, in, in many, many cycles. I think it's over 100 hertz. Uh, right. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we're also hardware agnostic right now with the tracking. There's a lot of solutions like in motion capture that are available for you know, finding out where a point in space is a lot, like yeah. a thousand times a second. So basically any system that is like capable of that, you know, doing that kind of uh, detection, we can use. Yeah. So there's a lot of different spatial uh, imaging technology out there to establish the track, everything from depth cameras to IR to uh, you know optical, and um, yeah, so, we're, so we work with again, all of those. I mean, this is um, recently I have come to become part of a company that is just about spatial computing, and now I can see, and I'm only in there to produce content. Sure. But now I'm, I'm beginning to see just interviewing people, and it's only day two of the interviews of the show hasn't even opened. <laughs> um, but now I'm beginning to see just the vitality of spatial computing and the, what I want to say is actually the ability to augment reality. I mm -hmm. mean, to literally shift and change. So this actually doesn't fall into what was previously my definition of augmented reality. No, uh, no, it's a yeah. little bit different. And one way to think about it is like compared to Pokemon Go, that's 10% CG, 90% real, meaning like what you're actually looking through on your mobile phone. We're swapping that ratio. We're saying literally just the actor and a little bit of set is real, everything else is CG. And that's the, that's the shift that we're making. How are you guys, how are you going to scale? Because this could <laughs> we, like take off like crazy. Um, we've been you've getting, got one project now that's 
people are going to say, how was that done? Exactly. Right. Um, so that when that came out, we got quite a bit of interest uh, to do the same type of thing. As you can imagine, our bread and butter is science fiction and fantasy situations where you literally cannot shoot it. So we're providing a good solution there. Um, and we, we have opened a round of investment uh, that, we're, that we're just this spring that we're if you're interested, please uh, contact us. Uh, but we should show the AR3D video as yeah, well. Yeah, let's, let's show the AR3D this video. Is what we sh this is what we've been working on next. You have, first of all, you've just like blown my mind. <laughs> and awesome. my, as a creator, my mind is just like churning and churning. As a former brand guy, my mind is churning and churning. And when I look at what's happening in location-based entertainment, these pop-up location-based entertainment centers in malls using vacated space, these VR parks that are being built around the world, um, the opportunities just seem like endless for you guys. If if people want to come to you, young filmmakers, new filmmakers, not just the studios, but they want access to this, how should they contact you? What should they do? Yeah, absolutely. So if you happen to be here at NAV 2019, we are at the Ledman booth. Ledman is one of our display partners. Uh, that is SL10105. SL. SL10105. SL so that's South, that's South, South Lower. Hall, South 10105. Hall Lower 10105. Uh, and if, uh, if you want to reach out to us, it's hello at arwall.co. Uh, we are located in Burbank. We're willing to chat with anyone about any project. Uh, yeah, we're happy to learn about what, what your needs might be. You, you literally, when I was asked to like title this and I said revolution, it, it, you really are starting a revolution. I, I'm so glad that we got to do this. I hope that um, I can just feel it bubbling. I'm being a little bit intuitive here. I just feel like I would love to have you back a year from now. Thank you. Just yeah. <laughs> to see what has happened over the last year. I mean, it, it boggles the imagination because this, literally, the sky is no longer the limit because you can replicate it. So I can give you a, a sneak peek at what's happening over the next year. Um, we're going to see a lot more of AR3D, a lot more projects using this technology uh, in film and TV. We actually just opened a, a permanent location in, uh, near Orlando in Florida with our partners Dolphin Image Films. Uh, that's the first um, uh, partner strategic alliance that we formed. Uh, with it's open for films. production, not open for... Open for production, mm -hmm. ready to go. It's a gigantic soundstage facility uh, just outside of Orlando. Uh, and then this summer, there's a second uh, a permanent soundstage opening up near London. Wow. Wow. I have to... The, the one thing that's great about NAB and the one thing that's great about NAB Show Live is we get to spotlight folks like you who are... You've been working on this for five years, did you say? Two years. Two years. <laughs> you crammed all of this into two years? Yes. <laughs> it's been a lot of sleepless nights, yeah. Well, I, I guarantee you, from my perspective, it's all going to be worth it. I'm so <laughs> glad to have had the opportunity to be with you. Renee, Jocelyn, Eric, Will, thank you so much for being here and sharing the technology with us today. And I wish you nothing but the best of luck. I will be calling about investment, <laughs> but I have a feeling I'll also be calling about production. So thank you so much. And I thank you, that. audience, for sitting you. through and <laughs> seeing the next thing coming. I'm out of here for the day, but I will see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock sharp for more immersive discussion.